just a big welcome to everyone that has just joined us and also a big welcome to those that may be watching the replay of this. Welcome to another one of our learning webinars. This time it's all about improving air quality in existing dwellings. I'm your host Andy Ferguson and joining me I'm really pleased to say is Cassie Williams, Divisional Manager at New Year. We are about to start the main presentation. Now, for those of you just joining, if you do want to pose a question over the course of the webinar, first thing I want to point you to is just to the chat facility on the desktop. That will either be on the left or the right hand side of your screen. Uh, if you're on a mobile device, you just need to kind of pull up and uh, you'll see the comments functionality in there. If you're watching the replay, if you email me at andy at property-care.org, I will endeavour to do my best to ensure that uh, your question gets answered. But for those that are also live, if you do want to pose a question via email as well, just use that same email address, andy at property-care.org. Or if you want, use one of our social media channels and just use the native search tool and um, pose your question that way. Well, Cassie, I can I can see that we are just after the nine o'clock mark. Um, so in terms, I suppose, of air quality and air quality in existing dwellings. Now, I know this is a subject that is getting increasing media attention. But when it comes to actually improving air quality in our buildings, what do we need to do? How do we even understand if we have a problem? And ultimately, what can we do to improve it? Some big questions, Cassie. Yes, yeah, some big that, questions. Um, yeah. Hopefully I'll manage to cover all those questions today. It's going to be more of a, an overarching introduction to how we can improve air quality. Um, and like you said, there have been a lot of um, a lot of mould and, and housing associations on the news as of late. So it is a big talking point at the moment. Well, I suppose without further ado, over to yourself. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me, guys. The first slide I'm going to show you is actually what I just discussed. Um, I'm here today to talk about indoor air quality. We've seen a lot of number of mould problems highlighted on ITV News this year. Um, a number of HAs, unfortunately, have, have been exposed um, to an extent that the Housing Ombudsman has actually launched now an investigation into social housing conditions after these ITV news reports um, saying that damp and mould is widespread throughout the UK. So this obviously mould does affect the indoor air quality. So this is something we will be looking at today. Um, air quality in general is high on the government agenda. Um, the next slide, I'm going to look at four guidance documents um, and all these documents are looking at how the problem of indoor air quality can be addressed in the UK. Further ado, so these are the four documents. Um, anyone with a responsibility for indoor air quality in homes, I would recommend, you know, maybe just glancing over or reading all these four documents. They are your guidance. They are your bread and butter, really, on how you need to act and how you need to provide safe air quality in homes. The first document is the government's Clean Air Strategy 2019. Um, this is a, they're all quite large documents. They're all about 100 pages, so they are bedtime reading. Um, so hopefully I can just point you to snippets. In this document, it's chapter six, where they see details of actions on how to reduce emissions in the home. Um, the second one is the Homes Act 2018, also known as Fitness for Human Habitation Act. A number of you might have come across this one. This was created with a viewpoint to protect the tenants from unsafe living environments. Um, examples within this document are they give the tenants the right for freedom from damp and they give the tenants the right for adequate ventilation as well. The third one um, is the slightly older document. It's the Housing Health and Safety Rating System, also known as HHSRS, which is always a mouthful. This is guidance for landlords on their legal requirements to produce healthy homes. Um, in this, they give categorizations of hazards, category one being the most hazardous, needing immediate action, then going down to category two and category three. In this document, mold is actually given a category one hazard and requires immediate action. The fourth document, which is the newest document, um, called Indoor Air Quality at Home. I'd say this is one of the most relevant documents for today. 
Um, this is guidance for local authorities, housing associations, even private landlords on how to address indoor air quality in the home. Um, this was written by Public Health England and was launched in 2020. So that's just an overarching guidance documents on why indoor air quality is becoming important to us. Um, the next, I'm going to do a poll um, just to get some engagement from everybody. Um, and this poll question is, how important is a healthy home and the air we breathe to you? So Andy's going to take over because I can only see the presentation screen. So one is not really thinking about it. Uh, two is been thinking about it. And three, starting to get concerned. And number four is you're very concerned about the, the air quality in your home. Well, guys, most of you know how, um, how this goes. Um, the poll question should have popped up for you on your screen. Um, uh, there are basically four questions. I'm going to leave it up for about uh, another five seconds or so. Uh, results quite interesting, actually. Um, there's a little bit of a mixed bag here coming Ooh. through, um, Cassie. So, guys, just a four, three, two, one, and just ending the poll. So, Cassie, just for your info and uh, also for our listeners, 46% um, of the people came back mentioning very concerned. Okay, uh, that's good news. Yeah, starting to get, get concerned. Mm -hmm with the least values being about thinking about, which surprises me as mm. well, actually. But that's a really good thing. Mm. I think it's important that people start to consider air quality because it is invisible. Um, I think if everyone could see the pollutants in the air around them, they would be quicker to act. But because they can't see them, it's out of sight, out of mind. So I am glad that everyone's starting to get concerned about indoor air quality because it is... It's very important to everybody. It's the air we breathe, so I'm glad. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm just going to run through the agenda. Um, so today we are going to look at why is air quality important to us? What is good air quality versus what is bad air quality? So we can understand. We're going to look at the sources of pollutants. Um, pollutants both from inside the home and pollutants from outside the home coming into our houses as well. Um, we are going to do just a brief overcap on the different types of pollutants because every pollutant needs a webinar in its own right. So we're just going to do a quick overarching today. Um, we're going to look at how we measure indoor air quality. You know, we can talk a lot about it, but how do we actually measure it? How do we know if it's good or bad? Um, and then we're going to look at how we can help everyone achieve um, healthy indoor air quality in their homes. So without further ado... Why is air quality important to us? Um, well, basically, like the, the chocolate says, we spend 90% of our time indoors. Um, we breathe in air every day that could be harming our bodies without us even realizing it. Indoor air quality, it's fundamental to our health and well-being. Um, like the, the slide says, long-term exposure, exposure to poor indoor air quality can cause respiratory infections and life-shortening conditions. This is something we do need to start noticing. The government now has classified um, air pollution as the single greatest environmental threat to human health in the UK. Now, that is a bold statement. And when I read it again, air pollution is the single greatest environmental threat to human health in the UK. And how many of us think about that on a day to day basis? So we're going to look at what is air quality? Um, air quality refers to the condition of the air within our surroundings. So good air quality is clean, clear, free from pollutants. So good air quality is the air we breathe and it has no pollutants. Bad air quality um, is, is air which has a high buildup of pollutants in the air within our surroundings. Um, how do we know if we're breathing in bad air quality? Well, sometimes you can get symptoms such as coughing, sneezing, dryness of the skin, headaches, nausea, inability to sleep. There are some good symptoms that can help us. Um, what we need to find out as well is, and what everybody needs to know, is those most at risk. So indoor air quality doesn't affect everybody equally. Um, the indoor air quality at home document that I referred to on the first page um, advises us, everybody in housing should be educated to know who is the most affected by poor indoor, air, poor indoor air quality? The people most affected are those with pre-existing conditions such as asthma, allergies, COPD, heart conditions, 
um, pregnant women, preschool children, and the elderly. So these are the vulnerable category. The air quality document again in section 1.2, it states that anyone should be able to request a housing assessment if they meet certain criteria. So if you live in the, if you're in those in the at most risk category and you live in perhaps an air quality management area, so those with highly polluted areas outside their homes, they can ask for a housing assessment if the property has inadequate ventilation. They can ask for a housing assessment if they have visible damp and mold on their property. And they can ask for a housing assessment if they suffer from overcrowding. So people now have the right to have the indoor air quality taken seriously in their home and ask for housing assessments. Um, we, today, we're going to look at five, uh, just only five, there are more, um, a particular five of the pollutants with inside the home. So the first one we're going to look at is volatile organic compounds. Um, many of you may have heard of these. They're also known as VOCs. Um, the second one today we're going to briefly touch on is radon. Um, that is a pollutant in the home. I know Andy mentioned there might be a, a, a set, um, the next webinar might be focused on radon. So that might be of interest to some. The third we're going to look at today is carbon dioxide. Um, the fourth is excess humidity in the air leading to mold and dust mites, which some people might have seen time and time again. And the fifth is particulate matter. Some people might not have heard of this one and the different classifications of the particulate matter. So what are VOCs? Um, VOCs are organic chemicals whose molecules can evaporate into the surrounding air. Once they're in the air, they come into contact with our skin or we inhale them into our lungs. VOCs can be your, your everyday home items, your day-to-day -day cleaning chemicals, detergents, solvents, paint thinners, aerosols, air fresheners, candles even, um, and even just general cosmetics in the home. So why are these general everyday products dangerous? Um, well, the Public Health England, they've actually done their research and, and they've given advice on this. Um, they're dangerous because they can irritate your eyes, they can flare up allergies, they can even cause asthma attacks, liver and kidney damage. Um, and these a number of these VOCs are actually carcinogenic, which means they do come with cancer risks. So high levels of pollutants or VOCs are not good for you. Those most at risk are people we covered in the previous slide, um, children, pregnant women, elderly, and those with pre-existing heart and lung conditions. So those in the at-risk category, you need, really need to be aware of your VOC pollutants in your home and how you can minimize them. The second slide, the second pollutant we're gonna look at today in brief, um, because this is a very serious topic and it does deserve a whole webinar to itself, is radon. So what is radon? Um, some people may have heard of radon, some people may not. Um, it's a colorless and odorless radioactive gas. Um, it's formed naturally, it occurs in uranium in the rocks and as soil decays. It actually rises up through the floor in your homes. So it comes like from ground level, it might be in the ground underneath your home, and it rises up there into the air, into our homes. Prolonged exposure to radon gas does actually cause lung cancer. I know that sounds very serious because it is. Radon is a serious pollutant that we all need to be aware of. Um, each year, about 2,000 people die from lung cancer developed as a direct result to radon. Um, this is second to only smoking. And we all know the risks with smoking. They're on the back of fag packets. They're, it's been made aware for everybody since we were little kids in school. Smoking is very dangerous, um, as is radon. So how do you know if you live in a, an area with radon? How do you know if your house suffers with radon? There is actually a radon map which indicates certain areas of the country have much higher levels of radon than others. Um, you can actually go onto the UK website and type in your postcode to see if your area is perhaps a potentially a radon exposure area. Um, if you are in one of those areas, what I'd recommend is you order a test. Again, this the link to the website. The test costs around about, I think, £50 to order from the government. Um, it's a device that gets put into your home. You need to leave it there for about three months. So they have continuous readings for three months. Then you pop it back. They tell you your level of radon in your property and they run through the, the possible remedial measures then 
based on the amount of what they call Baccarels, that's the measurement of radon. Um, the third one we're going to look at today is carbon dioxide. This isn't one usually talked about um, within indoor air quality. However, today I think it's really important because carbon dioxide is a naturally produced gas. We produce it when we breathe in. Um, the air that we breathe in only contains 0.03% of carbon dioxide. However, the air that we breathe out contains 4.4%. So the levels of CO2 in your home are often related to the number of people that live in your home. Obviously, the more people that are breathing, the higher levels of carbon dioxide will be present in the home. We like to look at carbon dioxide when we refer to indoor air quality. because Carbon dioxide is a good indicator to the level of indoor air quality. If the levels of CO2 have built up, it indicates there's poor ventilation in the home. Um, is it dangerous? Carbon dioxide at low concentration levels is very little, if any, toxic effect. It's only when it reaches higher concentration levels that some problems can start to occur. These are your everyday um, headaches, dizziness, tiredness, increased heart rate. So as we mentioned, it's a good general indicator of indoor air quality. If levels of CO2 start to rise, then you need to either open a window or increase the ventilation in your property to reduce the risk. <coughs> I know some people have asked about about COVID and the risk of ventilation. Just an example on this one, with carbon dioxide, um, I think the English government, they've actually ordered around 300,000 carbon dioxide monitors to be made available into schools um, in a help to determine if the ventilation is adequate. So for example, if the carbon dioxide levels are high, they, need, they know they need to improve ventilation to lessen COVID outbreaks. So it's just a very good indicator. The fourth one, um, which is the most common one, I think everybody's seen is a gone with moisture, which leads to, so we've got excess moisture in the property. We live, we breathe, everybody produces moisture. It's natural, um, but sometimes the levels of moisture in the air, they can cause excess humidity. Excess humidity then leads to condensation. Condensation then leads to damp and humid conditions. And in the damp and humid conditions, that's when mold spores and dust mites breed and germinate. Um, mold is the most commonly seen source of poor indoor air quality because it's visible. Um, and that's what we've seen highlighted on ITV News. Uh, molds actually produce allergens and irritants. Inhaling or touching any mold spores may cause an allergic reaction, such as sneezing or a runny nose, um, red eyes, skin rashes. Molds can also cause and trigger asthma attacks. Again, those in the most at risk category are most at risk for mold. Dust mites, they thrive in damp and humid conditions. They are microscopic spider like creatures which live in beds, carpets, soft furnishings. Dust mites and their feces, again, can actually cause and trigger asthma attacks when being inhaled. Um, I know we run a a ventilation division for, for new air and we deal with social housing. So we go into many of these properties where mold, um, damp and mold are present. And sometimes you do see children with asthma and they might be coughing in the middle of the night. That's because they're breathing in the mold and the, the dust mites and the feces of the dust mites and it's triggering their asthma attacks. Oh. Um, on Wednesday, the 20th of March, 2019, um, a new law came into effect with a view for protecting tenants from unsafe living conditions. It's one we mentioned earlier. It's known as the Homes Act, um, the Fitness for Human Habitation. This, in this act, it gives tenants the right freedom from damp and adequate ventilation. Um, the other one that we mentioned earlier is the, I've got to say this right, Housing Health and Safety Rating System, HHSRS. Um, where we spoke about earlier, damp is actually categorised as category one, which is the more serious. Um, and again, saying that immediate action by the landlord or local authorities is required. Um, with these now, these are actually legal documents. So local authorities are under a duty of care to take this action. If they don't, unfortunately, tenants can now, or fortunately, it depends on which side of the fence you're on, um, tenants can lay take legal action if these problems are unresolved. And I know we've seen many sort of um, door knockers um, for compensation companies um, 
do you have a claim? We'll claim no, no win, no fee. We'll, we'll get you compensation if you've got mould. So they are being um, targeted now, properties with mould. The fifth one, take a drink, this is a long one, um, is particulate matter. Um, many people may not have heard this. So what is particulate matter? Particulate matter is everything in the air that isn't a gas. It's microscopic solids or liquid droplets that are so small that we inhale them. Um, particular matter that, that is of most interest are the ones small enough to be inhaled. So obviously they come in all sizes, but it's the ones that we can inhale are the ones we need to pay attention to. Um, the particles on the screen. So yeah, the ones that we can inhale are less than 10 microns on, in diameter. Um, the picture on the screen, so we've got the grain of sand, that's actually 90 microns in diameter. So a single grain of sand is 90 microns. And the line is actually a human hair that is 50 to 70 microns. So PM10 is actually only one fifth the size of a strand of hair. So easily inhalable. Um, whereas PM2.5 is a quarter of the size of a PM10. So it's even smaller again. Um, in the classifications, PM10, that can get deep into your lungs and particles less than 2.5 microns. They are so small, they're known as fine particles. These are the ones that pose the greatest risk to our health. These ones can even enter our bloodstream when we breathe them in. Um, so do we know any common sources of particulate matter? The most common source of PM 2.5, which is the most dangerous, is domestic wood burning um, in the home. So people who have wood burning fires, this has become the single source, the single yeah, the single biggest source of particulate matter pollution in the UK, it actually produces three times more PM 2.5 than road traffic. Wood burning fires, they're, they're very nice to have in our homes and they're becoming quite popular. And I think a lot of people don't know the risk that they are introducing in indoor air pollution into their homes with PM 2.5. Asthma UK advises the wood burners should not be used if you have any other form of heating available to you. So they should only be used as a last resort. So, I mean, more education I think is needed on, on wood fires in the homes and, and the effects that they can have maybe on small children, on pregnant women, on the elderly. Um, it is something that we need to look at. So I just quickly rounded up the, the five pollutants that we're going to look at today. Um, so the question is now is, right, okay, I know what pollutants uh, potentially are harming my home, but I can't see them. So how can we measure indoor air quality? Um, simple, indoor air quality now, more and more monitors are becoming widely available um, throughout the UK. These monitors are capable for testing a range of pollutants and factors that impact our indoor air quality. Um, some monitors just only measure maybe one pollutant or maybe two pollutants. For example, some monitors measure humidity and temperature. Um, and people use these monitors because they can indicate situations where mold growth might be susceptible. It can help um, landlords identify maybe fuel poverty if people aren't putting their heating on enough. Um, then you can have temperature sensors, uh, temperature sensors, indoor air quality sensors that perhaps only monitor carbon dioxide because as we mentioned earlier, carbon dioxide is a good indicator of general poor indoor air quality. Um, we actually breathe out 500 litres of carbon dioxide a day. So if the buildup is great, then we know those areas, they're poorly ventilated because the carbon dioxide has managed to build up. Um, if the CO2 is not being diluted with ventilation, then we can assume, we can assume neither are the other pollutants that could be dangerous in the air. Um, there are some monitors that are available that can detect all of the all of the five pollutants that we mentioned today: um, carbon dioxide, VOCs, small and large particulate matter, humidity, and temperature. Um, so some of these sensors they can be relatively small, easily mounted on the wall, and they can even be monitored via an app on your phone. So if you've got poor indoor air quality in your home, you might get an alert, so you can take action to to remedy the situation. I know some housing associations now are looking at indoor air quality monitors that perhaps that are not just smart on maybe a phone, but actually link up to IoT systems so they can monitor a number of houses remotely from their head offices. 
Um, again, this is something some people might want to look into. So just the question now is how we can improve indoor air quality in our homes. I mean, the first rule before we look at any remedial measures, if, if we can remove the pollutant and source, this is what we should do. So if we can remove any sources of pollutants, start there. Um, the next step then is that I would recommend is to increase the ventilation in your home to disperse and dilute the number of pollutants in the air to replace it with clean, fresh, ventilated air. Um, so I would say the next step, if you've identified indoor air quality in your, in your property is, right, we need to assess the ventilation in the property. Firstly, we need to ask ourselves, does it meet part F? Um, these are the ventilation standards. Um, I've put notes to the, the document, the approved document part F. These are the general guidance and standards of ventilation that we should all have in our home. So are they meeting part F? Um, part F has the five different ventilation methods. So we can either have intermittent extract fans, which are your, your on and off fans, um, passive house ventilation, again, passive. We can have continuous mechanical extract ventilation. So fans that are continuously running um, 24 hours a day to, to remove pollutants. You can have mechanical heat recovery, which again, which is extract and input, um, or we can have uh, system five, which is alternative systems, which is positive input ventilation. Today, we are looking at existing properties. So the two simplest methods, in my opinion, um, for existing properties would be continuous extract ventilation. So you have um, a fan in the kitchen and a fan in the bathroom just to extract moisture or contaminated air or positive input ventilation, which we will look at in more detail. So we've got the ventilation strategy, um, extract system three. So I haven't included intermittent extract on this, this webinar purely because if you've got a kitchen and bathroom fan, that's just an on and off fan. You don't have a continuous removal of pollutants in the home and it relies on the tenant um, putting the fan on, putting the fan off. So if the pollutants have already built up, it needs somebody to action that. Whereas on continuous extract ventilation, the kitchen and bathroom fans, they're just constantly trickling. So you're constantly getting a, a flow of fresh air throughout your property. So these are the ones I recommend. Um, so again, the kitchen or the bathroom fan, the option is to achieve system three. Extract fans must be set to continuously run to meet the whole dwelling ventilation rates. They are found in the document part F, um, table 5.1b, if anyone wants to look at what the, the whole house ventilation rates should be. Um, for example, if you've got a three bedroom property, I think the background ventilation rate should be 21 litres a second. So you've got 21 litres of air being continuously changed in your property at all times. The, the other strategy that I'd recommend then is positive input ventilation. This is usually a system that in the picture is situated up in the loft. Um, it's designed to bring fresh filtered air um, at a continuous rate into the dwelling. So it will just constantly ventilate the whole house. This process, it dilutes, it displaces and replaces the unhealthy air in our homes with clean, fresh filtered air, resulting in good indoor air quality. So it's just a constant change, um, constant air change rate throughout our properties. Both of those examples are perfect if the air inside your home is polluted. However, if the air outside your home is clean, sorry, yeah, so those options are for polluted air within inside our homes, um, assuming that the air outside our homes is clean. However, what if the tenant lives in an air quality management area? The um, indoor air quality at home document, it states that anyone should be able to request a housing assessment if they live in a in a poor pollution area. Um, so what we need to look at now is the particular matter, PM10 and PM2.5 again. We mentioned the wood burning was a source within our homes. It can also be sources from external, so industrial um, or traffic. Um, just you generally live on an industrial estate or perhaps you need live near a steelworks. They will all produce uh, PM10 and PM2.5, so your outside air might be polluted. Another um, pollutant we need to look at is NOx gases. 
these are the ones that are produced by mainly by traffic, um, sort of by the pollutants from the exhaust that traffic has. Um, these pollutants, because they are created outside the home, however, we need to consider what are the effects of inside the home. So if the tenants open in the windows to allow the internal pollutants out, are they polluting their air, polluting the house more because they're allowing the outside pollutants in? So first we need to consider that. So how do we measure the outside air quality? How do we know if we live in an air quality management area? Um, firstly, you can find out the air quality measurement in your area from the government website known as DEFRA. This produces data on PM 2.5, PM 10 and NOx filtration. So what you can do, you can go onto that website link that I've mentioned in the screen um, and you can put in your postcode. So you can find out right where I live is it in a highly polluted area? What is the air pollution rate outside my property today? What do I need to be aware of? Um, there are also a number of air pollution apps available on your phone. Um, the UK Air site, it also, you can also get support um, from, sorry, from the DEFRA website. Um, it can give health advice and support to people who are in the most risk category when the air quality is poor. Um, like I said, there's also a number of air pollution apps available, air quality, London Air, I know I've used Breezometer. So, you know, it's, it's really handy to, for you to know what is the air pollution like outside when I'm walking up and about and, and what is the air pollution rate if I open that window maybe in the morning. Okay, so how do we change the ventilation strategies or our strategies to improve indoor air quality of the home if you live in an air quality management area. Well, firstly, we need to clean the air before it enters our properties. So if the tenant lives in an air quality management area, um, extract fans and PIVs will encourage the contaminants into the property from the makeup air. So say, for example, you use it in extract fans. Yes, you're removing the pollutants from inside your property out, but you're pulling 21 litres a second of air out of your property, that air is made up from somewhere. So through the natural leakage points of your house, you're pulling 21 litres of the polluted air into your property as well. Um, so what we recommend is, if you live in one of these areas, you need to clean the outside air before it enters the property. Um, and the only way we can do this is via filtration. Um, obviously, with extra fans, you can't filter the air coming in through natural cracks in your properties. So my recommendation would be to avoid extra fans um, if you live in these high polluted areas as a way to control your indoor air pollution. And I would move over to positive input ventilation, purely because we can put filters on a PIV system as it's bringing the fresh air into your home. So how do we filter these external pollutants? Well, NOx is a gas, so it's not filtered in a conventional way, like particulate matter, which uses material. Um, NOx is removed from the air in a process known as adsorption via carbon. Um, so you've got the, if you get a filter with carbon inside um, and the, the adsorption, it's attracted to a complex structure at the molecular level. This is where it gets a bit sciencey, so I'm going to briefly move over it quite quickly. Um, nitrogen dioxide is captured by the absorption process on carbon. The complex surface structure of carbon gives it a massive surface area. So a tablespoon of carbon gives it the surface area of a football field. So as you're running the air into your property over the carbon filters, it can actually absorb all the NOx gases and the air then going into your property is clean and filtered. So we can add carbon filters to PIV units, um, allowing the tenants to still have the fresh filtered air changes in their homes, and they can also keep the windows closed. So they've got the fresh air, um, the changeover air in their homes without having to open their windows into a highly polluted street. Um, particulate matter, which uses your more standard filtration, which is material basically with holes in. Um, it's a simple concept. The holes must be smaller than the particles that they're filtering, so they can't get through. So obviously the denser the material, the more filtration. Um, so you can get different filters. So obviously filters for PM10, the, the holes are slightly bigger um, and less dense. 
and the holes for PM 2.5 then needs to be a thicker, denser material. So it stops all the particles before. So the air, the air can flow through the filter, but the particles then will be stopped by the filtration. Um, I've included our in, indoor air quality boxes as well, because some properties may already have mechanical heat recovery in, um, and they are bringing air into our homes um, without any sort of carbon filtration. So that's just something to be aware of. If you do have a mechanical heat recovery system and it doesn't have carbon filtration and you live in an air quality management area, I would recommend you retrofit a carbon filter to those, um, to those systems. So just a recap on the four documents that we started with. Um, if anyone would like further reading around the subject, these are the four documents that I would recommend. <coughs> I don't know if any of you have come across all four documents before. Um, it might be worth Jimmy mentioning in the in the notes or in the in the chat box if any of you, of you actually use these documents as your guidance as your day to day. Um, so that was it for me today. So just a quick summary. Um, we've gone through air pollution. Um, we found out that it's the single grid single greatest environmental threat to human health in the UK, and it is high on the government's agenda. Um, air quality itself is defined by the degree of pollution in the air. Um, the pollutants that we need to consider are VOCs, radon, carbon dioxide, mole spores, dust mites, PM 2.5, PM 10, and NOx gases. I know I've thrown a lot of pollutants at you today. Um, and then we've had a look at how we can measure indoor air quality via digital monitors from inside the home. Um, we can go on the UK website to find out if we live in a polluted area. And um, we can also look at various apps to find out what is the air pollution inside and outside our homes. Um, and we can achieve better indoor air quality via education, um, removal of pollutants, increase in ventilation of the properties to achieve part F. And we've learned that if we live in an air quality management area, you may need extra filtration on the air coming into your property as well. And that's it for me, guys. Um, any questions or um, if anyone can add any questions into the, the chat box, we're more than happy to, to answer anything. Um, I'll hand you back over to Andy. Well, Cassie here, many thanks for that um, presentation. I have to say some interesting stuff really kind of popped up. I mean, the poll results actually kind of surprised me. I, I kind of figured there would be a, a kind of spike in terms of concern. I wasn't actually expecting it to be that hard, that that high, but um, God, maybe I'm just not reading it right. No, I'm down the country, which is just what people are kind of feeling and thinking at this moment in time. But also as well, I actually thought a particular interest was the monitoring stuff, which um, it seems to have hit um, a chord as well with the people listening to you as well, Hi. just for a couple of questions that have actually kind of popped up especially for myself. I think I'm going to pose a couple of questions to you after the webinar, actually more for my personal use than anything else, but kind of um, kind of just moving on to questions. Folks, just to kind of let you know, if you do have any questions that you do want to pose, um, now is the time to kind of do it. Taylor, just kind of fill it into the chat facility or um, uh, just ping me an email and I can pick it up. Um, Cassie, uh, I, I don't have a huge amount of questions. I think we've got about ten questions here. I'm going to start. Um, I, I'm going to start off with ones. There's been a mix of ones that have been emailed in here, as well as get okay. mentioned um, via social media. And that it's actually kind of COVID related, but there's four different questions. I'm going to try and squeeze this into one question because they're all about the same. But it's along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing, folks. So those that pose the questions, I do apologise. But it's along the lines of, is there any evidence mm. out there that improving air quality and ventilation helps minimise COVID risk, both within offices and within residential buildings? Oh, that's, that's a big question. That's a I know big, it's a big, question, a big question. A big question. And, it's, and it's probably not got a simple answer. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a professor. Mm. But mm. when I look at it, like COVID is a particle. So... Mm. For me, reducing the amount of COVID particles in the air by chance reduces the risk. Um, am I going to say if you've got a well ventilated house, you won't catch it? No, because the risk is still there. But, you know, it's the same as if you could see, I suppose if you could see COVID particles in the air, 
what would you do? You would remove them with ventilation. Do you mean you would increase that ventilation rate? So you would lessen your chance of breathing in a COVID particle. Mm. I suppose that's my my uneducated and doctor's opinion. But yeah, I might leave that one more to the scientists. But I mean, to me, mm. ventilation is is key to, to reducing COVID. Well, the one thing, and guys, those that know and tune into the webinar, I, I don't pretend to be an expert or, or someone of a voice of authority in any way, shape mm. or form. However, um, I, I'm, I am acutely aware of the amount of government advice that gets pumped out towards us uh, in terms of kind of ventilation and stuff like that. I suppose it's still a finger in the air, whether or not scientifically that could get proven wrong. Um, uh, that, sorry, not proven wrong, that's the wrong word. That, that can be proven. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we'll leave it out there. But guys, I am, I am interested to hear your opinions. If you do have an opinion on this subject, do feel free just to post it into the chat and kind of mm -hmm. let us know. I think you'd be interested yourself, Cassie, yeah. as well. It's quite a few, I'm reading some of the questions now. There's quite a few yeah. good questions on there. But my next question comes from uh, Christopher John George. Now, um, again, there's actually been one or two questions around about this, so I am paraphrasing again on this. But um, for those that live, for example, in a ground floor flat, um, they may have children in that flat, or even still they have an office and it's on the, the ground floor. How how best would you try and keep out fumes if you're in a city centre environment to both either protect children or to protect your workforce? I mean, for me, obviously, opening the windows is not an option if you mm. live near a busy road. So you do need to look at ventilation, but then you need to look at ventilation, like I said, with filtration. So if you were having like some sort of input ventilation unit, um, like a... I don't know what they call them, but like a, a flat version of a PIV, like our flat master, um, or any input air, is to have an IEQ box, to have carbon filtration. So the air you're bringing into your property, you're removing those harmful pollutants, and the air you can breathe in within your home or within your building is clean. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you are still going to breathe the polluted air when you take a walk, you know, but if you can minimise the time outside in the high-density pollution area, so maybe rush hour, um, you know, it's not, I do feel sorry for kids in, in London because they have to walk mm -hmm. during rush hour. There's not, you know, other than masks, there's not much you can do about that. But once they get to school or, you know, once they get to buildings, they should be able to have the right to breathe clean, fresh, filtered air. You know, they shouldn't have to suffer pollution um, mm -hmm. in their homes or in their workplace. So, yeah, if it depends on the, the pollutant level. If it's NOx, I recommend carbon filtration added on to any stem. Um, if the problem then is is PM, again, just normal material filtration for PM then as well. But filtration is your best and your, your simplest option at the moment. You can get um, filtration units that clean the air with inside the properties. Um, these can be expensive and they only clean the air in the room that you're in. Whereas if you're increasing the ventilation rate for the whole property, you're ventilating the whole dwelling. So... I mean, I know there's air purifiers, there's, there's, you mean there's, there's HEPA filters, there's, there's a number of other options, um, but the ones that I know best are, are ventilation and it's a constant flow then. So you're constantly cleaning the air. Yeah, well, just kind of following on from that, and again, it's more of a kind of, um, if you can maybe broaden it out to a wider recommendation here, but Chris, Christopher's actually also additionally asking, to, uh, could you advise of any particular units that you could install on ground floor flats that uh, were to have no roof voids that don't necessarily cost the world. Um, and now, Chris, I don't know if you're referring to in terms of that from a commercial point of view or a residential point of view, but Cassie, maybe you can just very quickly touch on both. Yeah, well, I work in the residential sector, so mm. I know those products. So, for example, mm. you can have um, a PIV unit, which is known as a flat master. So it brings air into the property and on the flat master then you can put carbon filtration valves if you're going into the property or, you know, even if you can get an IAQ box on there. Um, you know, so yeah, just send me an email. We can I mean, do recommendations. It does depend on the size of the property to see what unit you need to achieve the air flows. So it's a very broad, um, you know, I can recommend a fan with a carbon filtration. But until we know the size of the property and the application and the building regs, that's when we would choose the specific model. So yeah, I would just recommend getting a survey and, and going from there really. 
Okay. Well, I'm going to, but probably the most popular question today, um, certainly Jessica and Patrick from our uh, live audiences have been pushing this through, but I also got two questions via email on this, mm -hmm. which is to do with monitoring. Um, can you recommend any particular monitoring kits for air quality? Now, what there are people are saying is they're doing searches online and they can see there's a huge wide variety of monitoring kits, but where do they start? I mean, is there any ones that you would particular say are half decent? Oh, it's, it's difficult because this is an emerging market. Um, mm. So I know the likes of Switchy have air monitoring, um, Echo have air monitoring, but then this one's more suitable for just homeowners. Um, I think we just got like mentor, mentor air plus. So this is loads. I think this Nest is bringing out an air quality monitor as well. Cause I know at the moment I've got a Nest smoke alarm and the Nest system in my house. So when they bring that out as well, do you think that's something you can add on to an existing system? Um, so it depends. I mean, I know even uh, Ikea, have just launched PM 2.5 indicators in, in their, IKEA? IKEA. Yeah. IKEA, wow. And that is getting okay. mainstream now. So they've got yeah, um, yeah. a PM 2.5 indicator, which shows the importance of air quality in, in everyday, mm. every, you know, everyday life is, is mm. starting to become relevant now. Um, yeah. It's just a small PM 2.5 indicator, green levels are fine, amber, mm. bit of risk, red, mm. you need to put some action in place and they're like 10 pounds. You know, so wow. this is available now to to people in their homes. This is something we need to encourage as standard as smoke alarms, as carbon monoxide alarms. We should have indoor air quality systems and monitors and, and systems in place to make sure everybody's breathing. Because like the government says, it's the biggest health risk, biggest environmental health risk in the UK at the moment. So it's worth, you know, it's worth spending some time. And I think. Give it a couple of years, mm. it will be much more mainstream. People are starting to ask the questions now. Mm. That is interesting. I mean, I I, uh, I had in my head, you're talking about 200 quid or 300 quid potentially for these monitoring kits. But if you're telling me they're as cheap as 10 quid, yeah. that's, that's, so that's, anyone... that, that, that's, that's an unconscious yeah. purchase for me. That's just, you know, I'll pick it up and actually see yeah. what it actually I... tells me in the house. I would recommend anyone with a wood burner in their home to pick mm. up a PM 2.5 monitor from Ikea, because if that's next to you, you know, you're enjoying the nice cozy fire. It's lovely, you know, and, but mm. if that all of a sudden goes red, you're like, oh, okay. It is dangerous. People need that indicator. People need to make mm. an invisible problem visible again. And I think monitors is the only way to go about that, to really get people to think and to realize do I have a problem in my home? Well, the only way you're going to know is if there's an alarm telling you, yes, you do. Hmm. Not very interesting here, folks, just because this is actually quite a popular question. What I'll do is with the replay email tomorrow, I'll try and put in some information um, and I'll get some maybe guidance from Cassie just on this one. Um, maybe kind of point for a steer for a hint where you might be able to um, view some um, monitoring stuff. But uh, I'm not holding, I'm not promising that. I'll just try to yeah. do it. <laughs> um, here, just before I move on to my next question, um, David, Fredo and Simon um, Cadigan, um, just to kind of let you know, we're not actually doing the speak functionality at the moment. So if you can pose a question that you have just into the chat facility, I'll try and make sure it gets posed. Um, my next question is, comes from Fiona Kelly. Uh, She's asking how much of indoor air quality is the result of occupier behaviour? How I suppose what poor indoor air quality, I should say, is a result of indoor occupier behaviour. Now she has given an example here where she says, for example, ventilation is there but not being used. You know, I think yes. that's almost a case that's, of well, that's you're just the key. giving yourself yeah. a do now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean <laughs> that's that... going crazy. <laughs> that is the you mean within housing association that yeah, is the yeah. hottest topic they can yeah. they can buy all the ventilation in the world and put it in a property and provide the tenant with adequate mm. ventilation and if the tenant's not choosing to use that ventilation then that it does become their problem um what i would recommend if anyone has properties like that but they think the tenant's not maybe switching it off or they're not using it properly is there's a lot of fans out there now with um they run monitors or, you know, data loggers. So you, when you go to the property and the fan's running perfectly well, 
you can test it and say, right, okay, we put this, installed this van in maybe 50 days ago. How have you found, you know, has it improved at all? And they say no. But when you press the button, you see, well, actually, it's only been running for three days. So for any sort of legal claims, so sometimes tenants, you know, if they are suffering from mold and damp, they do turn to these legal companies to say, this is my last option. Like people have turned to ITV News, this is my last option. Um, and they need to force the, the housing association or the landlord to do something. But we know it's not just one sided, it's, it's two sided. So that is about tenant education and explaining to them why indoor air quality is important to them, because obviously they don't understand it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have turned the fans off. If they knew the impact on their health, they would leave it on. But it's just, mm. yeah, I would always recommend that day run monitor just to protect yourselves and to encourage the tenant to leave the fan on. Yeah, you know, I was having a chat going, uh, with Simon Smith just on the chat when you were kind of talking, talking to me on that. He actually mentioned as well that tenants seem to have this idea where it's expensive, it's bringing in cold air, um, that they end up removing fuses, blocking it up, yeah. um, um, drying clothes on the radiator, and they're all increasing the, 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 the RH levels basically within, yeah. within the problem. But I have to, and, now, and again, again, so, uh, and, and this is for everyone, I'm no expert, but but from my limited knowledge, I, 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 always, I was always led to believe these units were fairly cost effective to run. I think it was about five to 10 pence a day. Well, or, no, sorry, one to two pence a day, I think it was, was the um, average running value. Yeah, if not? you're looking at sort of extract fans, um, mm. you're looking maybe like pound fifty for the year. Um, if you're looking at positive input ventilation systems, um, they can be as little as, yeah, one, 1.5 pence a day, depending on how much they're paying for their electricity. Um, mm. And then if, they, if they're living in fuel poverty properties, sometimes we install ones with heaters they're a bit more comfortable obviously the heater element does cost a little bit to run it's a heater um but they are about sort of like 30 to 35 pound a year then to run on top but it's the tenant's choice you can have the ventilation with or without the heater it's, it's up to them then mm. my door just on <laughs> oh <that's> a... <laughs> yeah I, 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 thought I, was, I was doing really well i thought there's been no interruptions whatsoever and i'm like yeah, there's no one at my door i'm like they can just wait <laughs> Well, here yeah, I've only got a couple more questions because um, we are running out of time. But uh, Alan uh, McIntyre is asking, does an extractor fan cancel out opening up a window? Oh, is, is that a, is that a, how, how long is a piece of string? Um, now, now, he has added on just how to judge when to open the window as opposed to when to use an extractor fan or can you use both? procedures you can use both i mean opening a window is known as purge ventilation when you need mm. a big do you mean like if you burnt toast or you know like there's mm. paints you need to open the window to give as much ventilation in as possible um i suppose an extract fan it's there the ones i recommended are continuous running ones so they only run just on trickle in the background um mm. just to get that constant flow of fresh air if you're reliant on tenants opening windows you're reliant on somebody manually opening that window and mm. they would only open the window if they see steam, then they'll open mm. the window. Okay. But they wouldn't see VOCs. They wouldn't see, um, you know, the other types of pollutants in their home. So that wouldn't force them. That wouldn't prompt them to open the window. So it depends what type of pollutant you're, you're looking at. If it's just humidity, then yes, obviously opening a window is one way to, to purge vent the property. Um, but once you close them then and the humidity goes away, you've no longer got any ventilation to stop the other pollutants like carbon dioxide, like VOCs mm. or any of the other gases from building up. That's why we always recommend just that continuous ventilation because um, you're taking, you know, you're taking the, the worry and the problem away then from the tenant. It's just already resolved in the background. And yes, you can, if you want mm. extra ventilation on top of that, of course you can open the window. It's, you know, it's a benefit, but like we, we know, in a number of properties, if they're struggling to pay the heating bills, opening the windows is not an option for them because they don't want to lose the heat that they've already got in their homes. So they tend to seal the windows up. You know, you've seen in, you know, all the, the trickle vents sealed up, all the, any holes in the cavity. Do you mean they just seal every little hole they can? So if there's nothing to ventilate that property, then those levels of humidity will rise and damp, which is what, um, it's a good point by John Bradley in the notes there is everybody talks about humidity and damp that but that is only one indoor air quality mm -hmm. problem yep. 
and we can address that mm. one but you're not addressing all the others you know if you mm. purely do ventilation by humidity that's not taking into account the levels of vocs in your property or you know the levels of the other pollutants okay well i've only got one other question folks i do know there's a couple of questions that have come in that we've not necessarily had time to answer but what i will do is i will um try to endeavor um to um, send it over to cassie and um and i'm not promising but uh, hopefully she might be able to kind of get back to you but the last question i'm going to ask which actually comes from a couple of people both uh, christopher wendy thomas and alan online is actually when you were talking about co2 mm. as one of the common culprits uh, the question was what is the typical height or higher levels of CO2 before it can, I suppose, potentially becomes a problem. Now, there has been comments around the 1000 ppm kind of level. Do you have a kind of an opinion on this? Oh, um, I don't know about the ppms, but I know mm. it's generally over 5%. So it's the concentration mm. in the air. So I suppose mm. ppms might be another way of measuring that. Apologies, I'm not aware of that. Um, but generally, mm. the, the carbon dioxide, so in the normal air, it's 0.03%. And the air we breathe out is 4.4%. So the more air we breathe out, the more the higher levels. And they say it starts at, I'd say, over 5%. Okay. That's when things start to, obviously, you can get all the way up. It depends how many people you've got in a room, how tight mm. the room is. Um, so, yeah, increasing ventilation is, is a key to reduce that and to reduce all other pollutants as well. But it's well, a good indication go. factor. Well, there you go, folks. Well... Folks, just um, just before we kind of wrap up, I just want to see if you are looking for any additional guidance. You heard Cassie mention them um, earlier on. Um, I also posted links into the comments for the bulk of these kind of documents on there. I, I won't repeat them because Cassie's already gone over them, but I will say as well that if you are looking at um, um, find out more about kind of ventilation and towards codes of practice, guidance docs, etc., you can visit the PC ventilation document library where you will find that guidance. URL is on the screen there right at the bottom, just property-care.org forward slash ventilation library. Um, in case there's anyone out there that's uh, is interested in learning a little bit more about ventilation solutions, there are training courses that we do provide. Mm -hmm. um, starting off with the Residential Ventilation Masterclass, our evaluating ventilation in existing buildings, and also our diagnostic approach to understanding condensation, atmospheric moisture mm -hmm. and mould. My word, that's a <laughs> lot of words in that last one, isn't it? <laughs> but you can, you can find all of that training within the link which is on the screen there. Um, you heard uh, Cassie allude to earlier on, um, up, uh, our next webinar is all going to be about radon and we don't actually have a working title for it just at this moment in time. That's the funny picture with all the question marks on it. However, we will be launching that hopefully on Tuesday next week when, when the large majority of the country is back from the public holiday. I will be emailing out and uh, so just look out for that email there and hopefully we see many of you on to the next webinar. But lastly and not least, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone that joined us this morning. Uh, um, uh, also a big thank you to yourself, Cassie, as well for bringing together the presentation, also sharing your knowledge and the subject and also waking up um, nice and early this morning just to tell <laughs> everyone as well. And lastly, not least, just, uh, just to say to everyone that um, hopefully you enjoyed the presentation today and everyone has a lovely rest of the day. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and take care until the Bye. next webinar. Thanks, guys.